Hello and welcome. Podcast presented to you by the Brawl Network. I'm your host, Dave Steinwell. We are back after our week off. We took week 17 off, just like the Ravens did. The Ravens won week 17. Joe and I, up for debate whether we won week 17 or not. But we're both here. We're both back. We're ready to roll. We got a great guest. We got a lot to discuss. We're going to grade the position groups for the regular season. Then we're going to dive into some coaches talk and a whole lot more stuff that we will cover in this podcast. But I would be remiss if I didn't introduce my co-host, Joe Schiller. How you doing, buddy? Great, Dave. Happy New Year. Merry Christmas. It's uh, good to be back here um, recording, so I'm excited. Yes, Happy New Year. Happy holidays. Blanket in on the one the last, last week. week. <laughs> you a little feedback there. That's funny. But, um. Before we get to our great guest, Joe, we have to talk about Fanatics. They're one of our sponsors of this whole shebang. You can go to thebearsbrawl.com backslash Fanatics. They got all sorts of great deals going on, anywhere from 30 to 60% off. Joe, they will be having some Ravens gear eventually on the Brawl website, so people can go there and get some Ravens Brawl gear because, you know, I don't want to say this too. Most success podcast that the Brawl Network has. I'm just just putting that out there. (laughs) That's all you saying that. Hey, I'll look. I'll take the heat. I'm not afraid of Austin. All right, I went to college with him. Know him well. I'm not afraid of him. Mike Brez, I'm a little afraid of, but Mike, I don't know Mike very well, but I'm intimidated by his arm. So if he listens to the pod, Mike, I'm intimidated by you, but I will throw all the shade at all the other teams. The Ravens are the most successful. They knocked out the Steelers. So, Joe, let's introduce our great guest. Absolutely. Uh, our guest today is an old friend of mine, actually. His name's Chris, Schis- Chris Schisler. He's the uh, site expert for the Ebony Bird blog, part of the fan-sided network. Uh, Chris and I go way back. He actually gave me one of my first writing gigs, writing for Ebony Bird. So, you know, I progressed and started writing through there, became a co-side expert with him uh, way back. And he's just been, you know, riding the ship there, commanding everything there. Uh, Chris, it's good to have you on, man. Uh, it's been kind of a long time since we've been able to talk, but we're excited to have you on. How's your holiday been? I mean, you know, holiday's over, so everything is good. I, I was, you know, it was a nice holiday. It was pretty chill. Once it got here, and, you know, in the lead up to the holiday, I, I could, I could basically go without. But you know, that's how it goes this time of year. Yeah, football I, made it much better. Yep, I know you. You're just a guy who loves just talking some football, which is exactly why we have you on, man. Yes, sir. All right, so let's get right into it. So we wanted to kind of jump. Uh, a lot of the hot topic around the Ravens right now, aside from them going to the divisional playoffs, is head coaching interest. So the success on both sides of the ball has garnered interest between offensive coordinator Greg Roman and defensive coordinator Wink Martindale. Dave and I have kind of touched on this a couple of podcasts back because this has been a narrative that's going that's been going on with the success that they've had with Lamar Jackson and obviously the emergence of the defense after the week four loss to the Browns that both these coordinators are going to have opportunities to potentially become head coaches. What we know right now is that the Browns have officially requested to interview Greg Roman. We don't know exactly when that's going to be. Um, there's also potential interest being rumored that he could be interviewing for either the Dallas Cowboys job or the Carolina Panthers job. We know Jason Garrett's still kind of stuck in purgatory in Dallas right now, but he's probably expected to be fired, hopefully, when his contract's expired or soon by then. Uh, With Martindale, he's been reportedly requested to be interviewed by the New York Giants. Uh, According to, I believe it was NFL Network's Peter Schrager, he's reportedly scheduled to do that interview on Saturday. Um, And then there's also been reports that NFL Network's Ian Rappaport reported that if Martindale did become a head coach, he'd be interested in bringing on LSU passing game coordinator and wide receivers coach Joe Brady, who, if you've watched anything about LSU this year with Joe Burrow under center, that offense has exploded. I mean, they scored. It's a good call. Yeah, he's that would be a very interesting uh, pairing, especially for a defensive minded head coach. But uh, the other thing I want to touch on with Martindale real quick is he's been pretty. I mean, both these coordinators have been asked about this. Uh, They met with the media, I believe, on Tuesday. And uh, Martindale has been adamant saying it would take a dream type job to leave Baltimore. He said he loves this city, loves, you know, owner Steve Bashotti, John Harbaugh. And his, it seems like he's got a lot of roots planted here. I mean, he's been the defensive uh, coordinator for the second year now. He's been with the defensive staff for quite a bit. So, Chris, there's a probably a strong chance that the Ravens are going to lose one of these coordinators. So 
if you had to choose which one to lose, would who would it be and why? I would rather lose Martindale because I think Jackson is the future, and I think this offense is so unique. I, and I say that with the caveat of if you put David Cully, our wide receivers coach in there, or Urban, our quarterbacks coach in there, they probably would do the same thing, and I think we would hire from within. But defensively, we can get someone to come in and do what Martindale is doing. To replicate exactly what is happening on this offense, you need Greg Roman, and he's he's got all the wrinkles. I think you could hire from within, and you could have – a similar offense. I don't think you have the same offense. And I think keeping the nucleus together for Jackson as long as you can is a good idea. So if I had my druthers, I would keep Roman. Problem is, I think he's the most likely to leave of the two. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with you there. The thing that kind of strikes me interesting about this Browns job is the you know, obviously they're an AFC north rival and with all the drama and all the everything that's gone on with with the cleveland browns i wonder if you know Ray, greg roman's had so much success with dual threat quarterbacks that is this an ideal job for him to want to take there's no doubting that there's talent there right i mean we can all agree that there's an abundance of talent at, on that team but we've seen if you don't have the right leadership and the right coach in place it doesn't matter how much talent you have you can't succeed. And Baker Mayfield is definitely not the same type of quarterback Lamar Jackson is. And I just wonder if you're Greg Roman, you've had so much success with the, you know, Colin Kaepernick's of the world and now Lamar Jackson, you know, leading into what's going to be an MVP season. Do you want to go to Cleveland with a guy like Baker Mayfield who's just got a completely different skill set? And that's not knocking Baker. I mean, he, you know, shown he can be a very good quarterback and has a lot of future and a lot of raw talent to mold. But Dave, if you're Greg Roman and, you know, you look at this Brown job, a job that Matt Rule, who's been heavily linked to the New York Giants, declined this job. This could be a deterrent for some of the coaches. And I just wonder if you're Greg Roman, you're such in a good situation right now. Do you want to hold off for one of these other jobs? Because the Cleveland Browns job might be, it's on paper, you look at it and say it's very enticing. But what we've seen from this past season that's developed with this entire team, it could be a potential nightmare. I, Joe and Chris, if I was Greg Roman, I wouldn't take the Browns job. I That's just, there's dysfunction at every level of that organization. There's the way you go. That to me just doesn't feel like if I'm a head coach and I'm looking for my, that I'm going to take and feel like I'm going to be able to be in this job for five years. Now, I, the thing that I feel, and maybe Chris, Joe, you feel differently. I don't think either goes because there aren't that many openings. And and there are other top guys, like Joe mentioned, Matt Rule. You got Eric Bieniemy, the Chiefs offensive coordinator. There's not this plethora of jobs that there was uh, this past offseason. So I'm not so sure that actually either of them go because right now you're looking at the Browns opening, which we just talked about. That's not really appealing. The Giants uh, to me, uh, is not that appealing because of all their issues with Gettleman and how they built their rosters, especially if you're Martindale. You're not going to a team that seems to care about the defense, and that's that's his forte, so I don't want to go to a spot where they're not going to help me out and build me a great defense and free agency. So that eliminates me from the giant job. And, and then the Cowboys – uh, the Cowboys don't know what they're doing, plain and simple. So that takes them out. So to me, I don't see them going to any of the openings. They might was maybe the Redskins, but I think Ron Rivera sees a big chance there to revitalize everything. Joe, Chris, maybe you see it differently. I don't think either of them go. I think if anyone's going to go, it's Roman. I think Martindale's – the Giants is a possibility. But I, I think Roman – has a chance to go somewhere because I think he wants to be a head coach. I think he's at that point in his career where this is his best shot. And if he has that, he wants to do it, he's going to do it. I actually think Cleveland works out better for Roman than any of the other positions for a few reasons. One, I think Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt, you know, the running game is what's important to Greg Roman. And you need a quarterback that's mobile, but Baker Mayfield's not a statue. You just, he, he knows. It's not like he couldn't do anything offensively before he found Lamar Jackson. This is a guy who's 
coached several different positions um, as an assistant coach. Yeah, Baker Mayfield, he can work with that. The key is that they have a dominant running game, and he also knows, you know, Lamar Jackson. And if you're going to be a coach in the AFC North, Lamar Jackson is your number one problem. So it might be smart to get a guy who comes from a good organization for Cleveland, an organization that you'd like to emulate, even if your fans would hate to hear that, and get a guy who knows your opponent and knows how to run the football because that team needs to be a running football team with a play-action payoff with Jarvis Landry and Odell Beckham if either of them stay there because that's a Mount Suvius of nightmares. But I, I just I think Roman fits the Browns. I don't know that he'd want the Browns. I think he fits the Browns. There's a couple things I want to touch on because I agree with you. I think it would make sense. There are a lot of pieces there. With Roman going to the Browns, I just wonder if he were to have, obviously, two very talented running backs like you touched on, Chris, with Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt. The thing I saw with the Ravens is if you're going to be a team that's going to dedicate to the run, and obviously the quarterback plays a big part in that, your wide receivers are going to have to commit to knowing that they're not going to get the ball as much, they're not going to put up godly numbers in receiving game, and you're going to have to block. I just wonder if, if Roman gets there, it, and it did happen, I wonder how much shuffling could be done around the offense because – Odell Beckham and Jarvis Landry might not necessarily be those kind of receivers. Maybe there is some switch in personnel, but there definitely is a lot of interest there. And I think it would be, especially from a wrinkle from Greg Roman, knowing Lamar Jackson so well from the other side, if he was facing Lamar Jackson, there's just a lot of interesting pieces that go into it. And we know that John Harbaugh wasn't going to deny a request for either of his coordinators to take jobs. He's been adamant in publicly saying that he, um, he wants his coordinators to pursue other jobs. Well, not want would be the right word, but, you know, it's open and, you know, not going to stop his coordinators from, you know, receiving other head coaching interests. The other thing with Martindale I want to touch on is with a reported, you know, with all the reports that he could be bringing Brady with him, there's not a guarantee that Brady leaves LSU. There's been a lot of reports saying that, or, uh, that LSU and Ed Ogeron are very keen on Brady staying, obviously, with all the success they've had, and they could make him one of the highest paid you know, coordinators in college football. And money talks for a lot of guys. I don't care how much success you have. When you write a blank checkbook, those guys will listen. And there's not you know, not a guarantee that he stays there. So we'll see what happens. It's, it's very interesting um, in and out what's going to happen with this. But um, I think the Ravens are – are, are potentially planning on losing one of these guys. I think that's undoubtedly something that's going to happen. I will. It, I don't know, Dave. It's just it's one of those things where I think with the success that they've had on both sides of the ball, that, that's something that's going to happen. So we'll transition a little bit into this kind of end-of-season talk we want to go through. And we did mid-season grades for all the position groups. We're going to do the same thing, splitting between offense and defense. So I'll be the moderator here. I'm going to switch between you, uh, Dave, and Chris, going through each position. So we'll talk first. And obviously jump on the most important position, the quarterback spot. Obviously, Lamar Jackson's had an MVP-type season. He's going to be their runaway MVP when it's all said and done. There's no doubt about it. There's no questions about it anymore. So, Dave, I know this is probably easy grade for you and Chris, but what are you giving Lamar Jackson in the quarterback group here? Uh, I'll, give him, uh, I'll give him an A-. minus. A uh, little, little rocky at times there midway through the year, but the way he played down the stretch, the way he's finished, He's just done an incredible job of um he's done an incredible job of knowing where his weaknesses were within the season itself and making the adjustment. He knew, okay, if there were games where we fell behind, I will have to be a better passer. And you saw that from Lamar Jackson after that two game stretch when he struggled against the the Chiefs and the Browns. That I, I give him an A minus. Chris, you're probably looking at me going, "Why the hell is he giving him an A minus?" I give him an A minus because an A to me is the highest grade. So he gets an A minus. He was outstanding and a big reason why the Ravens are where they are. Yeah, I was kind of looking for a grade higher than an A plus because <laughs> I, I, happiness is based off expectation. And I, I was a guy who wanted Jackson. I wanted him to draft him. I was begging him on draft night. And when they got him, I was like, yes, they got my guy. So I came in this with higher expectations than a lot of people. And he exceeded my expectations. Therefore, I have to give him an A+. There's no other grade I can give him. Therefore, he gets an A+. 
I didn't expect him to lead the league in touchdown passes. I didn't expect him to have two games with a perfect passer rating, something that Ben Roethlisberger has done three times in his entire career. Um, I didn't, I didn't expect LeVar Jackson to be the MVP of the NFL. I thought he'd lead us to a 10, 11 win season and he'd show promise for the future. No, the future is now. We're 14 and two and the favorite to win the Super Bowl in the AFC. Still have to do it. There's a lot that has to be played out and we're going to get to that. I know, but A plus. It's, it's, if you're the MVP of the league, I'm not giving you a, a minus. That's splitting hairs. Yeah. And that, the fact that we're arguing about whether an A or A minus just shows how well Lamar Jackson has done this season. I think that's a good thing that we're arguing about that because he has exceeded all expectations. I think there's no doubt about it and how well he's played. There's going to be few and far between people who would have thought he would have made this jump, even if you were high on Lamar Jackson in the first place. So uh, jumping over to the running back and fullback position that we're going to combine together. This is obviously a group that contributed to the team that rushed for the most yards in a single season by any team in the NFL. is a 41-year record, I believe broken by the New England Patriots. That's uh, an incredible record to break, especially when you consider that it's pretty much all a passing league this year. Uh, this this kind of era, and the Ravens were you know, keen. They said this offseason that they're going to want to run the ball, and we kind of a lot of people scoffed, and a lot of people laughed, said, "How are you going to do that? How are you going to have success doing that?" But they averaged over 200 yards a game on the ground. So, Chris, we'll go to you. You give this grade. Uh, what do you give this grade for the running back and fullback group combined together? I mean, to me, this is a pretty solid A. It's it's not an A plus. It's not an A minus. It's an A. If you put the fullback position in there, I have to give the fullback position an A because Pat Ricard has been so integral to what they're doing offensively. Um, what I would say, running back wise, the only downside I see is I want more Justice Hill, and I want to see them use him better when they use him. So that's that's really my only problem with the running back. Mark Ingram had a couple of fumbles, but I mean. He's been a great leader and a fantastic playmaker. Um, I think he makes the offense a whole nother year. Gus Edwards, I mean, the guy's averaging, what, six yards a carry? I I can't knock him. I would like to see him be a bit, bit of a better receiver out of the backfield. But, you know, every, you are who you are. And that's why it's so frustrating we don't see more Justice Hill. But if my only knock is... I don't get enough Justice Hill. That's not even a knock on the running back himself. <laughs> That's a knock on the coaching staff. So I give it a solid A. With how do you and and I, I'm going to say this now because it's going to sound like oh I'm being a homer. I'm giving too much credit to the Ravens. They're 14 and two. You, the grades aren't bad. They're getting an A. So. People will probably criticize me, but I give the, the running backs an A. And, Joe, I've told you I don't know how many weeks that so much of the success that Lamar Jackson has in the run game is because of how dominant the running backs. And not just Mark Ingram. I know I've talked a lot about Mark Ingram and just how good he's been. But the whole running back room, this offense doesn't work if you don't have that downhill between the tackles running game because then you can do what the Chargers did in a playoff game last year. You can load up with speed and neutralize Lamar Jackson, but what neutralizes that and forces defenses into the pickle is Mark Ingram, Gus Edwards, and and Chris, even to an extent, Justice Hill, this downhill one-cut running game with the running backs, to me, if you don't have the running backs, you don't have as dynamic of a Lamar Jackson because everybody can just key on Lamar Jackson's speed. So to me, it's an A because it's so they so perfectly complement what Lamar Jackson does in this offense. And without the running backs, I don't think you see the same production because you see more teams taking the Chargers approach to stop Lamar Jackson. Yeah, I'll give it an A, too. Um, to touch on your point, Dave, we saw a little bit of that last year. Granted, Lamar Jackson was as was not as positive of a passer, of a, as a, of a passer at the time. But, yeah, the, the, the Mark Ingram signing for three years, $15 million, was an absolute steal. Uh, all credit to Eric DaCosta in the front office for landing that and getting him away from the Saints. And uh, to Chris's point as well, Pat Ricard's been a Pro Bowl guy. 
Um, what and then another another wrinkle of the front office being able to find a, a defensive lineman out of Maine and convert him into a guy who's been a one of the most you know productive two way players that you don't you don't even see any of those guys anymore. It's like a old school everything the Ravens are doing on the offensive side of the ball seems so old school and I just love it. So speaking of old school stuff, we're going the offensive line. Uh, I gave this group an A. They've been they've been crazy uh, crazy good for if you look at this line for. What they've been able to do, especially after losing Matt Skura with Patrick McCarry uh, stepping in. To me, Ronnie Stanley's had an all-pro year, uh, and the stats back that up if you follow and look at you know some of pro football focuses metrics and just in general with how well Ronnie Stanley's played. Obviously, Marshall Yonda is a, a Hall of Famer waiting to happen. Orlando Brown Jr. has been quietly one of the best right tackles in the game. And it, and Bradley Bozeman's quietly had a great season. We I feel like there was so much conversation coming into this year about who's going to have that left uh, about that left guard spot, and and Bradley Bozeman's quietly taken it over and performed really well. So, Dave, I gave this group an A. What are you giving this? You're the offensive line guy. So what do you give? Giving this group? Give the love to the big boys. I got them at an A. Again, it's the highest grade I can give somebody, but much like the running backs. If you're not dominant on the offensive line, I don't care what playmakers you have at your skill position or at your quarterback, it won't matter because the offensive line is what starts everything. They open the holes in the run game. They give Lamar Jackson the time to throw. I mean, without them, if they're not as dominant, we may still be a good team, but my God, their dominance in games, and I mean, just... To show you how good they were, the backups dominated the front four of the Pittsburgh Steelers that, to me, was one of the best front fours in the AFC all season long, and they pushed them around for four quarters. Give them an A. I love the big boys. It's time we give the big guys some love in Baltimore. Yeah, you guys want me to argue that an offensive line that allows the best running game in the history of the NFL is not getting an A. Um, I'd love to say B plus because in the beginning of the year, there were some shaky moments, but Bradley Bozeman figured stuff out. I don't know what he did, but he figured stuff out and he's played fantastically. Marshall Yonda is Marshall Yonda, as we've kind of all said. Orlando Brown Jr. is maybe the best right tackle in football. And Ronnie Stanley is the best left tackle if not the second best left tackle in all of football. So to lose Matt Skura, have Pat McCarry come in and play so well. I mean, you had a couple of bad snaps against the Bills. That's the thing. They get an A because the offensive line has had a few bad moments and a whole season. What other position group can really say that? So I'm going with an A for the offensive line. I, I kind of want to give it – I'm tired of giving all these high grades because it makes me feel like, <laughs> am, I really, am I really being objective? But they get an A. They earned it. Yeah, I mean, you could, these, obviously these grades are objective based on, you know, what your opinion. But with how well they performed this season, I mean, this is one of those report cards that you're bringing home to mom. She's putting up on the fridge. That's just one of those ones. So – the, an interesting stat that I saw from Pro Football Focus that, that talks about how well the offensive line has played is Lamar Jackson's been pressured at the ninth lowest rate of any qualifying quarterback, despite being the only passer to hold on to the ball for over three seconds on average. Obviously, Lamar Jackson's a dual threat quarterback, has the ability to get out of the pocket like no other, but for him to, th- to hold on the ball that long in the offensive line, to give him that time in the pocket, it just shows to how dominant they've been. And, and the results have showed in, on, uh, in the run game and in the passing game for how well Lamar Jackson succeeded in this second year. Some of his favorite guys that's rode through this season have been the tight ends. Uh, Chris, we'll start with you. This is a group that's really considered a three-headed monster with Mark Andrews, Hayden Hurst, and Nick Boyle. What's your, what's your grade for this group? I'm going to give him an A-. minus. And the reason I give them an A minus is because Mark Andrews has some drops and someone's got to pay for that. Uh, The drops, you know, hey, he's one of the best tight ends in the league. Nick Boyle is a great tight end. And the fact that I'm saying Nick Boyle is a great tight end shows you how awesome and how far he's come. And you look at what Hayden Hurst does. 
he does everything. And does this guy ever drop anything? Um, the only problem I have with the tight ends is that there's occasionally a play where Mark Andrews, I'm like the Seattle game, but we had a big third down, uh, second down, I'm sorry, a big second down forced us into a big third down in our own territory. Cause he dropped a wide open pass. There's been a couple of those this year. Um, Hey, you know what? Andrews gets an A minus on the year. Everyone gets an A. It averages out to an A minus. I love, I love Andrews. I think he's one of the best tight ends in football. I and maybe I'm nitpicky, but I want to see him just catch everyone instead of just catch 99 percent of them. It, am I being nitpicky here? Maybe, but I've given A plus A A. An A minus won't kill anybody, and maybe it'll serve as a little motivation. You know, work on the hands just a bit. Uh, Chris, I'll go with you. I'll give him an A minus, just because again we're giving out A's like we're Oprah giving away gifts on her show. But um, I, I look at I look at the tight end group. Uh, Nick, the best blocker, hate a little leaves a little to be desired in a blocking game. So that's where I put him in an A minus. And you hit the nail on the head, Chris, with the. The, the drops with Mark Andrews, you just hope they that they don't happen in the big moment in the playoffs because, my God, that's that would be killer. But they get an A-minus. They've been about as good as advertised as at the tight end position. But there are little things like Hayden Hurst is not the best blocker. Mark Andrews has a case of the drops. And Nick Boyle is not fast. He cannot outrun anybody. So A-minus for me, Joe. Yeah, I look at this tight end group kind of like the running back group in a little bit. There's you know three different guys that have three different kind of skill sets, and they complement each other so well. And I think that's how the Ravens have you know succeeded on the offensive side of the ball to have those guys that you know you don't see many groups with three tight ends that are regularly featured in the offense. And same with the running backs too. And the Ravens said, and Greg credit to Greg Roman for you know putting this scheme together and allowing all these guys to really show their strengths and complement each other. Uh, the final group of the offensive. Uh, side of the ball here we're going to touch on is a wide receiver group. This is a group that I look at that's not completely finished and surrounded for Lamar Jackson. He drafted uh, Marquise Hollywood Brown the first round this year. He's been on and off the field with some injuries and inconsistencies at time, but he's shown flashes of being a great wide receiver. He's extremely fast and a very talented guy that we want to see, obviously, featured more in the offense next year when he's hopefully fully healthy and recovered from all the ailments he's had. Dave, I'll jump to you. What are you going to give this wide receiver group for a grade? I'll give him a B because, and this is where, like, I read Mike Preston and I read some of the other comments. Oh, the wide receivers are disappointing. Well, they don't have to be great in this offense. And, I mean, you got guys like Willie Sneed and Seth Roberts. I would give both of them A's blockers. And when you need a catch, they always seem to be there to make that catch at the wide receiver position. Uh, I think it's unfair to give these guys a harsh grade because at the same time, Lamar Jackson throws more to the tight ends than any other quarterback. So they don't get a lot of touches, but they'll get a B because Miles Boinkin doesn't look like he's grasped and comfortable yet in the NFL game. Marquise Brown, it's always going to be the question of his health. He's missed some games. He kind of he disappears at times. He almost looks uninterested at times if he isn't getting the football. That's a little concerning. I'll give this group a B as a whole because up to that they'll make plays when they need to make plays. Chris, what are you going to give this group? I'm going to give this group a B minus, and the reason I'm going to give them the B minus is. Now I'm going to go with the negative of Chris Moore was supposed to have this breakout season every year. He doesn't. Um, he had that play against the Browns where he's wide open and he couldn't come out. He had all day to put his feet in the ground and he didn't. And that's when we're like, okay, Chris Moore on the offense doesn't provide anything. So then you have Seth Robert who steps up, thankfully. But Miles Boykin and Marquise Brown aren't ready to produce a great deal. I think Marquise Brown has done good. I'll give Marquise Brown and Seth Roberts an A. I agree with Dave. Um, Marquise Brown has done what you would expect him to do, being the athlete that he is and the way they use him. Miles Boykin's good. Um, he's a great blocker, but I'm not giving 
cookie for wide receiver wide receivers blocking. It's great that you have the attitude that you want to do it. I'm glad you're doing it. But I mean, we're not getting a huge involvement of the receivers in the passing game. And part of me wonders, is that because we love the tight ends or because it's just not there at wide receivers? Willie Sneed is your most reliable guy. And Willie Sneed is a number three receiver on just about every team in the league. That's the problem. So the wide receivers, I give a B minus. They're doing their job, but they're not making a huge impact. And they're really the only position in the entire offense that isn't making a huge impact other than blocking and Marquise Brown extending the the field and giving them something to worry about. So I give them a B minus, not because they're bad, but because the impact just isn't the A level of everyone else. Yeah, that's a fair criticism, and I don't think Dave and I would argue with you about that. And I think the Ravens came into the season knowing that they didn't need a dominant wide receiver core because they were going to be running the ball so much. And Lamar Jackson still found a way to be very productive, obviously lead the NFL in touchdown passes. And Mark, in- or Mark Andrews has had a big play in that, uh, been the Ravens' top wide rec- or top receiver this year. This is a group that I think the Ravens didn't have a ton of cap space coming into the season anyway, but they have a ton of flexibility going into this upcoming offseason. And I think they could add a piece or two, one potentially in the draft or you know, target a guy in free agency to bring in uh, maybe a veteran guy. Obviously, they already extended Willie Sneed for one more year to be in Baltimore. You still have Boykin. You still have Brown. Chris Moore, I believe, is a uh, impending free agent. And then Seth Roberts will be as well. So there could be a lot of turnover in this group, which will be good because I'd like to see some more faces added to it to give Lamar Jackson some more targets in the receiving game. So we'll jump over to the defensive side of the ball. I'm going to combine defensive line and defensive end together. Chris, we'll go to you. What are you going to give this group? So we're putting edge rushers in with the defensive line? So so I'm going to do defensive line and defensive ends, and then we'll do outside linebackers and inside linebackers. So the Judons of the world will be next. Okay, cool. Just clarifying. Um, I'm going to give the defensive line a B. They, they're they there. When Brandon Williams is, isn't is there before the Justin Ellis and DeMonte Pecco signing, it was a little rough. Um, but they're there. They stuff the run. My problem with the Ravens' defensive line has always been they don't have anyone on the interior that adds pass rush, and it bothers me. But they do their job. They they earn their salaries. I give them a good solid B. Well, Joe, being a defensive guy, I'm going to be very. Uh, they get a C plus when they run it. When you run it, Brandon Williams and Michael Pierce, they're dominant. They're one of the best run stuffers in football. But Jesus, if you get outside the guards, you're going to run against this Raven defense, and that goes to the defensive ends. They're just not good enough, and that's going to be the concern depending on who they get in the playoffs is they're giving up rushing yards when they shouldn't be. They don't have the edge containment, and a lot of that starts with the defensive line, and I'll be even more critical, Joe, Chris, when we get to the linebackers, but C-plus, they don't get much pass rush. They got some run stuff for outside the guards. You're going to have success, and a lot of that's on the D-line. Yep, we'll jump to outside linebackers and inside linebackers. Uh, for the inside linebackers, there's been a lot of turnover this season. They came into came in the year with, a, we thought, maybe a three-man rotation between Kenny Young, Chris Board, and Patrick Owasso. You know, you go into ending the regular season, and Josh Bynes and LJ Fort were your main guys, and the Ravens did extend LJ Fort as well. Patrick Owasso kind of almost faded out a little bit. Outside linebackers, you lose Terrell Suggs, you lose to Zaria Smith, who's had an all-pro season, in my opinion, with the Green Bay Packers this year. You add Jalen Ferguson. It's been kind of an on and off group for both of these guys. Uh, this is one of the biggest areas that Eric DeCosta in the front office added in on the fly. Uh, we've seen this group have a little bit more success, but to go to Dave's point, I still have concerns going to the playoffs about the pass rush, about containing the edge on that outside running game. So we'll go to you first, Dave. This outside linebackers and inside linebackers group, I have a feeling you'll be a pretty critical with it, but what's your grade? Uh, I'll go with C. I, I, I've been toying with potentially going with a C minus or even a D uh, plus because this unit is bad. I know how good Matt Judon is, but to, to have to go and make all the changes on the fly, 
You didn't have the inside linebackers. I, I've said this from the get-go. You had to go out and make all these moves. They're nice pieces in Bynes and Fort, but you're not dominant there. Patrick Owasso, he's lucky he's still on the team. I'd have cut him for the stunt he pulled at practice, but that's just me. This is just the disappointing group. I don't know about you guys, but to me, this is what Eric DaCosta needs to spend the most time on in the draft and in free agency. They have to rebuild this linebacker group because – Part of the issue with the run game that set the edge very well in Judon. And Judon's the best out of the three, but Ferguson and Bowser are not very good. They get taken out of the play. You don't have linebackers that step up. Your linebackers are still not very good in coverage. There's a lot that I don't like about this unit. So they get a C, and they're very lucky that I'm being I'm in a nice mood tonight. Well, I think I'm in a nicer mood because I'm going to give them a C plus. <laughs> and, and it's it, it. Here's the thing. Here's the thing with with the linebackers. Matthew Don's playing really well, and Jalen Ferguson and Tyus Bowser have Tyus Bowser has shown spurts. The outside contain has been horrible. I there are times I want to just throw them an F. Just no, I'm done with it. But. When you consider how they reconstructed the roster and how much better it has been, it, it helps the grade a little bit. And the fact that Jalen Ferguson, I didn't expect Jalen Ferguson to have no problems. Tyus Bowser starting to get it to click. It's a little frustrating that we're just talking about him starting to get it to click. But yeah, and it LJ Ford's played great. Josh Bynes is okay. Oh, also, is you hit the nail on the head with him, to be honest, um, Dave. Um, but I'll give him a C plus. It, the defense has been incredibly better. They've had good games, and Matt Dudon is playing at a high level. And he shut me up because coming into the season, I was like, I don't know if I'm going to be uh, pay Dudon. Now I'm like, oh, well, what else do we have? If we don't pay him. So definitely, he earned his money this season. Matt Don, LJ Fort, they raise the grade. Everyone else, it goes down a bit. But I'll give it a C plus. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what the Ravens do with Matthew Judon. I've seen reports, and I agree that I think their best route is to probably franchise tag him. I think they definitely need to keep him around. And uh, Bleacher Reports, Matt Miller, who covers a lot of NFL draft college, uh, nationally said that one scout told him that decision makers are heavily focused on drafting pass rushers and building up a defense that can dominate when they have a lead. So Eric DaCosta, that coaching staff in the front office, I think definitely see that that is probably the biggest weakness of the defense. And to me, that's priority number one going into the draft. I know that's looking a little bit ahead, but I think when you evaluate all the position groups right now, defensive uh, pass rush is the biggest for me. So jumping into what I, and I think you guys will all agree, is the strength of this defense is a secondary. Uh, we combine the cornerbacks and safeties together, but it's been a fantastic season for this group. To me, as as terrible as it was to see Tony Jefferson get hurt, I think this is where when Chuck Clark stepped in was when this secondary really decided to uh, excel, and especially with the Marcus Peter trade. Touching on it, I love that they extended him. I think that was such a great move, and I said that at the time, and Dave can vouch for this, that I love that Eric DaCosta traded for Marcus Peters to get Ken, to trade for Kenny Young and a fifth-round pick for a guy who was one of the NFL's top cornerbacks at times, and to extend him and keep him around is a fantastic move. Um, I don't, it's not even biased. It's just it's a, just a great move that the Ravens have made. He's made an impact immediately since he came over to the Ravens with different pick sixes. Just that attitude and aggression. I love that he's clapping in the receivers' faces and the attitude he brings to that. This Ravens defense is a guy who fits right in. So I've been um, I've been very excited to watch him. I've been very impressed with Chuck Clark stepping up. I think he's an extremely smart player. Obviously, the Ravens think so too. With he's been handling the green dot, the communication for this defense. Obviously, Earl Thomas. He's always going to quietly be that guy back there. I don't think he's the he's not the safety he once was with the Seattle Seahawks in his prime. But he's very solid, and he's been a very solid signing for them so far. Marlon Humphrey's developed into an All Pro cornerback, and I think that's going to be reflected. Uh, once you see a lot of these awards come out the end of the year. And Jimmy Smith has been an on and off. He's had his injuries, but he is always a guy to have in the back end that you like. Uh, to have a veteran presence. And same with Brandon Carr, the guy's an iron horse. He started, I believe, his 192nd consecutive game against the Steelers. That's just incredible. He's a pro on and off the field. Uh, but, Dave, I'll jump to you first. I give this secondary an A, and I give him an A+. 
Uh, what's your grade for him? I'll give him a B. The because uh, I got taken early in the year, guys were running free in the secondary. They weren't communicating very well. They've played much better here in the second half. I will give them all that. Outside of Marlon Humphrey and Jimmy Smith, this is not a great tackling secondary at times. And that is concerning because when you blitz as much as the Ravens do, you have to be able to tackle in the back end. And there are a couple games. The Niner game in particular bothers me. The Bills game where we saw guys in the secondary not want to stick their nose in and make that tackle. That can't happen when you blitz as much as Don Martindale does because you don't have a safety net behind them. But guys like Marcus Peters have played very well. Uh, Marlon Humphrey's been outstanding. I think Jimmy Smith gets a bad rap because everybody goes, oh, my God, he he, pl- he lets these underneath routes happen. And I just and I don't want to get too technical and I'll try not to. But what Jimmy Smith is doing is being a smart football player, because most of the time when he gives up those underneath pass routes, it's because the Ravens are blitzing and he has no help behind them. So he's got the old approach of I'll give you the five yard completion because I'm going to come up and make the tackle. What I'm not going to let happen is me try to jump that route. that tackle and you're gone 30 yards down there. So that's what he's doing, and I think he gets a bad rap for it. But it, it, it's a B as a whole. This is a solid unit, but it isn't the shutdown secondary that I think everybody thought it was. And I, I'm a big proponent that you got to be able to tackle at all facets. And there are just times where guys don't look like they want to make that tackle, and that will that bothers me. I'm going to give it an A-. minus. Um, because ever since Marcus Peters came, this has been awesome. And to Dave's point, I, I do always use that your opinion of Jimmy Smith as a barometer of, do I care about your opinion? Because, <laughs> because when people dislike Jimmy Smith over the years, I'm like, Smith, I, I mean, he's a good corner. He's- so I, I have a problem with Jimmy Smith getting the criticism he does. I think it's hilarious that he has the exact opposite approach as Marcus Peters, and it shows you that players who are who they are and they're good at it can do it different ways. Um, Marlon Humphrey is the best corner in football. Earl Thomas is great. So I have no problem giving them an A-. minus. The beginning was rough, but the uh, improvement has to inflate the grade a little bit as well. So I give them an A minus because they've gone against some great quarterbacks this season, and they haven't had any success against the Ravens. Ironically, ironically, Baker Mayfield's probably had the most success against the, even in, in the uh, thirty-one to fifteen loss the Browns had uh, of any quarterback against the Ravens, and I, I think that says a lot. Russell Wilson, Tom Brady. They got they got nothing. I guess Patrick Mahomes torched us, but that was before we fixed everything. So I give him an A minus. Ever since Marcus Peters came, it's been fantastic. Dave, I, I would just, your point. Joe, I would just like to say that I'm glad that Chris respects my opinion, and I'll see myself out. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy Smith's a guy I'd like to see back next year. I know a lot of people are going to clamor for you know the Ravens not to resign him, but I think there's a, probably a mutual respect between Jimmy. And also the organization with how they've handled a lot of things that he's had throughout his career. And he's a solid guy that I'd like to see back next year, just for the depth and just obviously locker room presence. I'm a big proponent of having those veteran guys there. And I think he's a guy that probably fits well in there. Uh, Dave, I agree with you on the tackling point. There's been times where I just we just know Marcus Peters is not going to be a guy who's going to come up and, and make that game saving tackle, make that tackle off front. That's just the kind of cornerback he is. And you live with it knowing that. That's just how he is. But Marlon Humphrey, on the other hand, has been – he is so fun to watch as a cornerback. He's almost like a linebacker playing cornerback with how physical he is. There have mm-hmm. been a couple times where he has just met wide receivers at the line of scrimmage and crushed them. It is He is so fun to watch. And that punch out that he had against Juju Smith-Schuster that won the Ravens the game in overtime, those kind of plays to me – set him apart from other top cornerbacks because he has that physicality. And we see a lot of cornerbacks who are afraid to come up and make that tackle. He wants to make tackles against running backs and guys at the line of scrimmage. And I respect that. He's a ton of fun to watch. And a guy, when the Ravens first strapped him, 
everyone was like, why do we need another cornerback? And now we're looking at him saying, this guy is the future of our cornerback group. So I think that's pretty special to say. And to last, this should be a pretty quick grade, I think, all around. Although there's one thing I do want to touch on. For the special teams group, I'll give them an A- minus just for the fact that Justin Tucker has had some misses at the extra point level and the field goals. People do try to make this a big deal. I don't think it's much of a big deal at all. You had a guy who set the expectation that he hadn't missed an extra point up to the Saints game last year. This is a guy who's the best kicker in football. The stats backed it up. He's the most accurate in NFL history. And when you look at the scheme of things, when he's missing some field goals and some extra points compared to what we see on a regular basis from other teams, I think you just can't take that for granted for what the Ravens have in Justin Tucker. And when we expect perfection from our kicker for what he's shown us through all those years, you're going to be a little distraught and start to question things when he starts to miss a couple kicks. But he's human. They're going to happen. Uh, it hasn't cost the Ravens any games this season, so I'll give them that. So I will give this group an A- minus solely for the fact that Justin Tucker's had a couple misses, but I am not a proponent that this is a barometer of him declining or anything like that. We see him doing dances and, and singing and all these things. This is a guy who I just love to watch, and and to me this uh, special teams group gets an A- minus all around with Sam Cook and Morgan Cox. You're not going to punt that much and be on the field. That's just, just a, you know, a points to how well and how dominant the Ravens' offense has been. So, Chris, what's your grade for this group? See, <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. I love. I love the different uh, No, Come here's on. here's the deal. The, they give a kickoff return for a touchdown against the Bengals, which makes that game competitive when it shouldn't have been at all. Right off the bat, um, Cyrus Jones has a fumble. The Jets game, albeit on a short week, is it? I. Uh, <laughs> I don't – that was – we allowed three plus 20-yard uh, kick returns, a 31-yard kick return. We had a block punt, and I did we miss an extra point? I, 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 I'm I not crapping on Tucker because Tucker is the GOAT. Sam Cook is a great field goal holder. I don't think he gets enough credit for that, and he's a great punter now that we use him anymore. Um, Morgan Cox is great. The Wolfpack, they get A's. The special teams unit as an overall, uh, it's uh, it's. If we didn't get the Anthony Thomas back there, we would have had at least one more disaster. It, they get a C. There have been times where on kickoff they're not in the they their lane discipline is like a, a it's so bad. It's like a preschooler at recess. They they're not doing their job, so they get a C. They get a C because there have been too many slip-ups in special teams, especially when you have a special teams head coach. You have a head coach who made his name on special teams, and you ha- you have problems on kickoff and 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 punt team. I, I, I just, I mean, it, it's been good. It's been bad. It's been good. It's been bad. The Wolf Pack is always good. They so that doesn't factor into the grade as much. Special teams gets a C for me, and I, I really don't want to do it, but I don't see any other option. Yeah, let me preface with this. As I gave an A um, to to the Wolf Pack, I almost kind of blanked. I didn't even think to consider the, the special teams coverage unit, but I completely agree with you. I don't want people to think I'm fully wearing those purple sunglasses, but <laughs> the uh, – but yes, I've I've been on the record talking to Dave about it too, especially after the Jets game. That this special teams coverage and every in return game has been very underwhelming. DeAnthony Thomas has uh, he's been secure back there catching punts, but I just don't think he's really added much to the return game. I've been on the record saying I just wish he, you know, with a guy that's explosive as he is that we know he can be, he really hasn't done much with it. The Ravens haven't had much consistency at the return game anyway uh, on the punt side, especially. Uh, really since Jacoby Jones, in my opinion. So, yes, I will give that group a C, C, C minus in that end with the coverage and return game. I don't want people to think I'm some huge bias guy. But, no, I definitely agree that the the the, the second that the, uh, the punt returns and the and the kickoff coverage definitely leaves some room to be desired. So, Dave, I didn't mean to cut you off, but what's your grade? Joe, Joe nice, nice save because I was just about to say, good. God, are you yeah, got no, the- I, 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 yeah, I once Chris started talking about it, I was like, man, I, I need to save face here before people start leaving one star. <laughs> I was look, I was just gonna call you an internal optimist and move on with it, but uh they get a D. And honestly, the thing keeping them from an F is just how good Justin Tucker, Sam Co- uh, Sam Cook, and Morgan Cox are. The rest of Things. They get they like they're bad. Uh, De'Anthony Thomas, 
doesn't look like he wants to catch a damn ball. He doesn't want to run the ball back for that's for damn sure. So you got that. You don't get much out of a return game. Your coverage is awful. Uh, I, one of uh, one of the coaches this is one of my favorite sayings of all time, and I'll use it here. The Ravens coverage on punts and kickoff teams look like a bunch of six year olds at a soccer game where everybody just huddles up and goes and chases the ball. Nobody keeps their it looks like a, like an elementary school soccer game where it's just like a herd of sheep chasing the ball around. That's what the Ravens' punt coverage and, and kickoff coverage looks like. They're bad because it, it terrifies you that they could cost you a game in the playoffs. So they're awful. They get a D. They're lucky they don't get an F, in my opinion. Yep. Uh, there's definitely room for criticism with this group, um, especially since you know we've handed out a lot of A's, a lot of high grades for the other groups, deservedly so, that this has been one of the most underwhelming parts of the team this year. And I think John Harbaugh is probably very frustrated with that, especially him being a, a former special teams coordinator. So we'll wrap things up here real quick. Uh, for the sake of time, we'll keep it short. But I wanted to touch real quick. The Ravens have off for the first round by this week, so they won't play in the wild card round. But they do host the divisional round on the 11th in the 8:15 Saturday night game, which I think is going to be awesome. They have three potential opponents they could, uh, they could face in that game. It's going to be either the Houston Texans, the Buffalo Bills, or the Tennessee Titans. They cannot face the Kansas City Chiefs because they have a first-round bye, and they can't face the New England Patriots because they just factoring they, uh, the seating-wise, it it's not possible. So I wanted to touch on real quick, just to get your guys' opinion briefly, if you had to pick one of those three teams that you would want the Ravens to face on that Saturday night, who would it be? Obviously, the Ravens have already played everyone in the AFC playoffs except for the Titans, so... That's the only team they haven't played yet. So, Chris, I'll go with you first. What's that team that you'd rather have the Ravens stack up against? Give me the Houston Texans for three reasons, and I'll make it short. Reason one, I don't trust Bill O'Brien in a big game. Reason two, we smashed them already, and I think the matchups are the same. And reason three, I think we honestly could run for 300 yards and if we really made that a goal, I, 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 with JJ Watt coming back, maybe it's a little bit better for the Texans, but we smashed them once we can smash them again. Buffalo. I, I think they can, they can game plan better than anyone against Lamar Jackson. I think they have the best shot at taking the Ravens down Tennessee. I don't want because we haven't played them before. I like the advantage of knowing how it went the last time. Although I think Tennessee is a matchup that you'd expect the Ravens to win. So I want the Texans and I want to smash them worse than I did the last time because I I just will never take a Bill O'Brien coach team seriously until he gives me a reason. To. Well, the, uh, Chris took my answer. I think the Houston Texans is the best matchup all the way around. For the Ravens, because I don't think the Texan offensive line is very good. I think they'll get they get pushed around in a second matchup. Uh, the weapons on the outside scare me a little bit, but I don't think Will Fuller is going to be healthy to play even into the second round. So I think the Texans are the most favorable. Uh, I look at the Buffalo Bills as another favorable matchup because the game is in Baltimore. I don't think Josh Allen is as good on the road as he is in Buffalo. I think that that would being in Baltimore would change a lot of things for the Buffalo Bills. So I think that's a favorable matchup. I'm like Chris though. The Titan game bothers me if the Titans do happen to beat the Patriots because of that run game and that outside run in particular. Because what did we just talk about? Where did the Ravens struggle? Outside runs. Derrick Henry. Probably the best back the Ravens would have faced. The Titans are probably the matchup I don't want to see out of the three. But the Texans or the Bills, I think either one's a good matchup for the Ravens. Yeah, someone asked the Ravens coordinators this week about game planning a little bit more for the Titans rather than the Bills and the Texans because they already faced them. They confirmed they said that's kind of what they're leaning towards. It's a weird week. You almost treat it like a bye week, I guess, uh, with being off for that time. But I'll take the Texans too. That's who I had before we – 
uh, pin this discussion. I think the Ravens had a lot of success against them. They got to Deshaun Watson. Even with adding Laramie Tunzel, the Ravens still got a season-high seven sacks on Deshaun Watson. They ran all over them. And I just like the matchup and what Chris said. I think I don't really trust Bill O'Brien in those situations, especially in those big games. We've seen the Texans struggle in those wild card matchups. So give me the Texans as well. Uh, the Titans game would be interesting. I still think the Ravens do match up with them well. Ryan Tannehill's been playing some great football. I can't believe I just said that, but he's been playing, <laughs> very, he's been playing some very good football. So all credit to him. And Derrick Henry is the NFL's leading rusher. So, you know, there's a reason why they're in the playoffs. They're a very well-coached team with Mike Babel. And I'm, I'm excited to watch that game against the Patriots. I think that could be a very interesting matchup for what it's worth. But I think that pretty much wraps it all uh, up, Dave, if you want to send us home. But, Chris, man, it's been great catching up with you, and I'm so glad we were finally able to get you on. Absolutely. Anytime, man. <laughs> All right. So that's going to do it for this edition of the Ravens for All podcast. We will be back next week. Joe, you got us a big fish. No offense, Chris, but you got us a bigger fish next week. Why don't you tease that out for us? Yeah, Chris is a, I'll give credit to Chris. Chris is a big guess. I, don't, let's, let's throw that out there. Chris is my <laughs> guy, so I got to defend my guy. But we got Sarah Ellison joining us next week. Uh, she's a former editor for the BaltimoreRavens.com website. Uh, she actually began the late for work column that I've been so fortunate to be able to co-author this season. So she's going to be a great guest coming up. I'm glad we started this year off strong, and uh, let's keep it going. All right, so that is going to do it for us, for uh, Chris, for Joe. I'm Dave Stonewood. Enjoy Wild Card Weekend. We'll be back next week. We'll break down the matchup as only we can. So long. Have a great week. Happy holidays. Happy New Year, everybody.